Our three panelists today have all served on the, as chair of the Met Council, but their extensive backgrounds on regional policy issues make them people who understand what it takes for an area like the Twin Cities to build prosperity and a high quality of life for everyone. Ted Mondale uh, has a long history with regional issues. As in the state Senate, uh, Mondale authored key legislation on land use and planning and was the chief author of the Livable Communities Act. As Met Council Chair, Mondale uh, championed the Hiawatha Light Rail Line, now the Metro Blue Line, <coughs> and uh, led implementation of mixed use and transit oriented development in the region. Since leaving the council, he has served as Vice President of Strategy and Research at Greater MSP and has served as Chair of the Minnesota Sports Facilities Commission and CEO of the Minnesota Sports Facilities Authority. You may have heard of one of his larger projects in that role, US Bank Stadium, which is hosting a football game sometime soon. Uh, Sue Haig has uh, chaired the Met Council from 2011 to 2015. She has an extensive background as a community leader, serving as a Ramsey County Commissioner and Deputy, uh, Chief Deputy Ramsey County Attorney, and as President and CEO of Habitat for Humanity. During her time at the Met Council, the agency saw the first regional housing policy plan in 35 years. Over $75 million in grant funds cleaned up brownfields, simulated development along transit lines, and funded affordable housing. Sue presided uh, over the opening of the Green Line LRT, connecting downtown St. Paul and Minneapolis, the Red Line and advanced work on the proposed Orange Line, and extensions of the Green and Blue Lines. Earlier this month, she announced that she is retiring from her leadership role at Habitat for Humanity, but I'm sure we have not heard the last from her. Finally, our last panelist is Kurt Johnson, and he was uh, chair of the Met Council from 95 to 99 and oversaw the merger of the Council, Metropolitan Transit Commission, Metropolitan Waste Control Commission, and Regional Transit Authority. He is a writer, teacher, and college president who served as policy advisor and chief of staff for former Governor Arne Carlson. His advice and opinions are always in demand, over, and over the last 20 years, he has written articles in over 50 newspapers and magazines. Currently, he serves as the publisher and executive director of CityScope, a global web-based news service covering emerging innovations in cities around the world. Please welcome our panelists. <laughs> So our structure today is the first question I'm going to throw to all of our panelists. After that, I will take a question, I will direct it at a specific um, panelist, and all of you may answer if you like, or if you just want to sit one or two out, you're welcome to do that as well. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, why do you think a regional approach is valuable, and do we need a regional body like the Met Council? It's for everybody. Ted? I'll take it. Um, <clears throat> Number one, it's the most efficient way to deliver government services. But secondly, um, you know, I met Mike Langley at Greater MSP when he came up here from Pittsburgh, and he brought some of his sewer commissioners. And the reason they came here was they had 85 sewer districts in the Pittsburgh area, and they were like, the cost to flush the toilet here is really expensive. How did you guys do it? And, you know, as Met Council chairs get called into all these groups, and one of the key things that you hear from other regions is, we decide things, but we have no place to put the things that we decide to be able to implement it and have it work and happen on a day-to-day -day basis as routine. <laughs> and I think that's the, the efficiencies and the ability to come together with policies and implement them, not in a heroic fight, but in a day-to-day -day way, I think are the two most important uh, reasons for the Met Council. Well, I, and I certainly agree with that. I think the other thing I think about is um, uh, land use. Land uh, is such a precious resource. It's going to get developed. We're never going to get it back after it gets developed. We're going to have to spend a lot of money to fix it if the development is wrong. And uh, when something gets developed over here, it impacts something over here. And uh, local governments, cities and counties, um, can solve some of those issues on their own. Uh, but if there's a regional vision <coughs> and a regional plan, I think we're going to make better decisions for the long term. And that's you know, really the idea behind the council. Kurt? Well, Brian, maybe we should cue the soothing music from the video again, uh, <laughs> because this is a little bit like 
responsive readings and liturgy. I mean, we all kind of know <laughs> that we came to this because we are generally in agreement about the need for the thing we're celebrating. Uh, I, would, I would crystallize it all by saying that the region is the real city. And while we used to be pretty well organized at the federal level, we are certainly well organized at the state level, and in this region, pretty well organized at the neighborhood level, all across the United States, we are conspicuously lacking in being really organized at the regional level, and yet that is where most of the critical decisions that affect the prosperity and the success of most people in this country lies. So I remember at least a dozen delegations coming here from other places, visiting us, looking us over. They almost always want to see the Metro Council. The reason is not mysterious, it's unusual, it's rare. And when they see it and they leave, they always say, gee, we wish we could get one of those for our region. And we always have to confess, well, if we had it to do over today, we couldn't get one either. <laughs> That's the bad news. The good news is we already have it. All right, well, Kurt, I'm gonna direct the first question to you. Uh, as, the, as the scope of the council expands, uh, we add more and more uh, very important questions and tough issues to tackle uh, to our, our to-do list. What do you think, looking at the next 20 or 50 years, is the single most important uh, issue that the council needs to address? Well, that's a tough one. Of course, it's easy to be right because most of us are gonna be dead before anybody <laughs> knows the answer. Um, <clears throat> It's, um, well, my goal is to live forever. So far, so good. Well, yeah, we're doing, we're doing sit-down comedy here yeah. now, right? Uh, I really think that most of the things that dominate the debate today will seem primitive and quaint and antiquated in those 15 years. So we're debating today about in, in, enhancing density becoming more urban, more like an urban place. Uh, whether to have sidewalks, and meaning they were named that because they were along side roads instead of just walkways. Uh, equity, shutting out or putting down significant parts of the population. All of those debates that are going on today are gonna seem really quaint and primitive 15 years from now. So what will we be debating? I think among those in this region, it'll be how to use the asset of water more strategically. Uh, a long time ago, a previous president said that, uh, you know, bourbon was, uh, bourbon, compared bourbon to water. Well, water is still a very precious resource. We have more of it than we may be entitled to. We are not as respectful of it as we should be, and yet it is a strategic resource. The council probably, even being selective, probably, probably ought to be deeper into that bucket. The other one that everybody's reading so much about these days, which I think is just as inevitable as the adoption velocity of a smartphone starting in 2007, is autonomous vehicles. And some region somewhere is going to figure out that there are opportunities embedded in this inevitable adaptation. And that region will have first mover status and get ahead of everybody else. That's what I would nominate. No, I, I guess I would say that the one thing that we haven't totally figured out is the housing, housing and uh, how to make housing available and accessible for everyone in every income range. And whether we're today in 2018 or we're in 2048, People have to have some place to live. And so how we build and design housing, how dense it is, um, how we all get along when there's a whole bunch of us together, um, and how we can afford uh, to build more and to create more efficiency in housing, I think will continue to be a significant issue for, for years and years to come. Uh, I, I guess I, I love the idea of the autonomous vehicle, and I think that's going to come a lot faster than any of us can possibly imagine. Um, my husband and I took a lift. We don't do that very often. We were just feeling so hip, so young <laughs> uh, on a Friday night. 
And it was like, this is amazing. This is just like the very best thing. This is just, and it was inexpensive. It was cost effective. And so I just wonder how quickly we're going to adapt to these new behaviors and how we can imagine how that's going to impact our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Hard to imagine how that's going to work. I think the most important issue facing us today and for the far foreseeable future is the attraction and retention of a quality workforce. Yeah. And it, you know, if, if you look at the numbers of the crunch that we're in, and if we don't start doing better, um, we're not going to have the kind of life that, uh, we're not going to pass on to our kids and grandkids the kind of life that we had, because the economy can't grow if we don't have the workforce. The council is key in making sure we have a good transportation system, that's roads, that's fixing the bottlenecks, that's better transit. Um, that's more lines, and then the housing issue Sue referred to is very, very critical as well, and then workforce training, which I know isn't a, uh, a council uh, um, duty, is I think the third piece of those three big issues we've got to figure out. In a out. way, Ted, I hope that the council, as it embraces the challenges of equity, as Chair Turnemoff was saying in her speech, will not concentrate too much on the tired agenda of just removing barriers, important as that is, legitimate as it is, but realize that just as you said, it's an economic necessity. I mean, we can't do without the people we are leaving behind and shutting aside. We need them desperately to do the work that needs to be done. So even out of harsh economic necessity, the equity agenda ought to be big. Two of you mentioned autonomous vehicles, so I'm actually going to go back to that a little bit because that's an area that I'm extremely uh, interested in. What effect do you think, uh, you know, the specter of autonomous vehicles, something that we know is coming, what effect does that have on the, the controversial light rail debate as we're, as we're planning for more rail or expanding rail? You know, in theory, things might be changing very soon. Yeah, I, I don't think it's ever an either or. I think it's a both and. Uh, and I think as we're planning for, <laughs> uh, we, we, we are going to need both things. We need different types of choices for different types of transportation in different parts of the region. Um, and I think, as I think about those, those communities that do the best job at their planning for the future, uh, they recognize the differences within their communities in between communities. And that's our, that's, I keep saying our, it's not the right pronoun anymore, is it? It's the Met Council's responsibility, um, you know, to help think about those issues um, that transcend those local government lines. And I think that, that this whole issue of autonomous vehicles, and I'm sure there are a lot of smart transportation planning people at the Met Council who have spent a lot of time thinking about it and have some good ideas. Um, I think it's going to be fun and exciting, but it's not going to be an either or. It's going to be a both and. Even with that said, Brian, just ask yourself how much your behavior has changed since 2007. Ask yourself how much the kids have changed since 2007. The autonomous vehicle movement is likely to be something even faster, even more radical, and even more revolutionary. Now, what does that mean for light rail, for anything else we want to talk about? Somebody needs to be thinking about it, and thinking about it in terms of how does it affect the whole region. Well, I, I, I would just like to add that if we get to that state, and Kurt, I remember you like personal rap and transit too, so this is sort of... <laughs> <laughs> but, I did. <laughs> which has been made obsolete by what we're seeing now. So. And that's a good day. Yeah. That's a reason to get up in the morning. But if you think about it, and you think about the Uber pricing when it's busy, there's no way it's going to be economically viable to be able to carry rush hour uh, commuters into the city and out of the city and, and, and then have the car sit around all day. What do you get? So I think it actually enhances the need to be able to get to people to commute to and from work on a stable, uh, you know, on time, good system that's affordable. And then maybe you go to lunch across town and you get an autonomous car there. So I, I really think it's, like, like Sue said, it's not an either or. I think it actually makes the, the rail lines and others um, more important. Okay. Sue. 
you were, you were chair in 2014 when the Green Line started running. Uh, since then, development has really popped up around uh, the Green Line. What role do you think LRT plays in development? And do you think that BRT, Bus Rapid Transit, uh, will generate the same level of development? I, I, I do think that BRT is going to be a great uh, enhancement for economic development. I live and work around the A-Line. I've taken the A-Line. It's awesome. And um, I have seen so much development, so many ideas for development just in the last, you know, 48, you know, 48 m months, probably three, three to four years. Um, and that was before it had even really been up and running. Uh, once it's up and running, I think there are so many uh, parts of the community that will benefit from that investment. Will there be more investment along light rail? Absolutely, there will. Um, uh, and it's, you know, it's built and designed for those areas of maximum density. But the development, the five billion dollars that's been developed uh, is just, it's truly extraordinary and it seems like there's no end to it. So uh, we are very fortunate in this uh, metro area uh, to have had thoughtful, community-based, um, development opportunities, so we're really engaging people and thinking about the very best ideas, and we're going to need to keep doing that um, along the, the BRT lines as well as the LRT lines. Because from that comes better development, more efficient, more productive, um, and so that planning work is really key, I think, to getting the right type of capital investment in. Ted. Do you think the council functions more as an operational body or as a policy one, or both? I think it's both. I mean, I think the operational piece is important. Um, it helps guide the planning piece. But there, there needs to be leadership in this region. Um, there needs to be a place where mayors can come together and decide things. There needs to be, you know, the, the council needs to be out there. They need to be educating. They need to be... Um, trying to bring about consensus and building partnerships. And you, you can't do it on a city by city level. You have to have that entity out there. And I think having the operational piece tied into the planning piece made the council much stronger, um, much more welcome, especially when you had money to come out <laughs> to their district. Um, and I think it helped. I think the moves that were made made the council much stronger, much more relevant. All right, now let's get to what the people want to hear, controversy. <laughs> Kurt, Metropolitan Council has, uh, has been a point of discussion and frankly controversy. Since the inception of the council, its governance has been challenged. What is your opinion on the calls for governance reform uh, or abolishing the council? And do you believe that elected officials should be on the council? That's a nice, safe question. Well, I can't remember any legislative session in which there weren't bills to abolish the council, change the council's makeup, change the council's function. I suppose that's good news. It means that the people elected to our state offices think it's an important body, one way or the other. They either love it or they hate it. Well, not to, not to interrupt, but as an appointed member by a Republican, there were Democrat bills to eliminate the council, and I was fine all talking the, to them All the that. time. As a matter of fact, the, the closest, I think, that the council came to being an, elect, an elected body, the two authors were Myron Orfield and Tim Pawlenty. Uh, way, way back, a there's long a, time ago. There's a couple. I think, just to tee up this debate, which we won't conclude here, because thoughtful people have disagreed about the solutions for a long time, and they'll continue to. But I think two things ought to guide us. One is that it is absolutely inevitable to find a way to increase the voice of local government. Local governments feel left out, they feel denigrated, they feel like they're second-class citizens in making regional decisions, and the noise is getting louder, the pressure is getting more intense. I think it is absolutely inevitable that there will be a governance change. The question is, will it be better or worse? So I think one principle ought to be to find a way to increase the voice, the influence of local government in council governance. The second thing, thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Just the two, three mayors are here, <laughs> uh, county commissioners. 
The second thing, though, is to find a way to do that so that it does preserve a regional perspective. That's the thing that is distinctive about the council. That's the thing without which you don't have anything. And if you can't get people to sit around the table and really look at the region as a region, the same way the orchestra has to, or the twins have to, or the Vikings on some Sundays have to, uh, that has to be preserved at all costs. Should elected officials be there? I would only say to, for starters, elected to what? You can only be elected to one thing, and if you're elected to be a commissioner in a county or a councilman in a city, that is your elected position. That does not make you an elected member of the Metropolitan Council. Uh, there are practical problems as well, but that is a problem that is both constitutional and moral. You just can't be elected to more than one thing. Well, I, I think I, we, have a, uh, we have the Supreme Court discussing that uh, soon, <laughs> right? <laughs> You know, when, I guess exactly. one thing I would say is uh, one of the reasons uh, when I had the opportunity to chair the Metropolitan Council is that I wanted to take that job is because I love working with local elected officials. I think they're hardworking. I think they know their communities better than just about anyone. And I love the opportunity to work with them. And I think there are many examples in the, uh, in the metro area where that is actually working very, very well. The, the, concern I've always had is certainly the one that uh, Kurt sh shared, which is, you know, if you're going to be elected to be a city council member, a mayor, or a county commissioner, you, you have a district, you have a group that you represent, and you owe your first allegiance to them. Um, you know, whenever we, I think that bill that was the plenty, uh, um, <laughs> the uh, Strange Bedfellows bill, the Palenti uh, um, Orfield bill was probably an elected uh, Metro Council uh, bill. So districts, elected districts, just like legislators are elected. Um, and, and maybe there's some reason to discuss that. I guess we've always found in having that conversation with legislators is that would create a pretty powerful body in between the legislature and the local mayor, and most people don't think that's a great idea. It just adds another, um, another uh, layer there. So I, I'm not sure that's the best thing. I, I don't disagree that having a, a strong voice for uh, local elected officials in some way makes sense. You can do that through partnership. You can do that through good relationships. Um, and I think that much of the conversation that we have today about the Met Council, we know is being uh, kind of revved up for a broader political purpose, uh, trying to divide the, the people who live in the metro area from the people who live in greater Minnesota, which is kind of crazy because this whole metro area, so many of us, we grew up in small towns in Minnesota. We identify as Minnesotans first. Um, and you know, maybe urban people second, and uh, I think it's kind of crazy, and I, I think we gotta have a different conversation about that. Do you think that. it would make a difference, Sue, if the nominating committee that produced the list from which the governor had to appoint people was made up exclusively of people controlled by local governments? Well, I think when the Governor Dayton's nominating committee was put together, it was, with the exception of one person, every person who served on it was either a mayor, a, for, a council member, um, a former legislator, a county commissioner, and we had one business representative uh, on that nominating committee, and a strong voice from local government uh, leaders about uh, people who were appointed. So if you look at some of the appointments that were made to this Met Council, mm. um, lots of people had a, a, a experience as planning commission members, ma mayors, local government in some way. So lot, I think that's really important. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's why this council has been a, a terrific council at really understanding local government. I really think that <laughs> there's no harm in having local elected officials be appointed to the Met Council. All you have to do is look down the street to Greater MSP. They have their Partnership Advisory Council, business leaders and elected leaders working together. I never, when I was there, ever saw you know, a mayor lobbying just for something in his, own, his or her own city. It didn't work like that. 
Now, maybe it was the quality of the people that came on, but I think, there, I think when I was calling around for this program to a bunch of uh, elected officials, and I, I live in Carver County now, Chanhassen, the hate ashbury of Carver County, <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I don't go much out of it, but, but it was unanimous that local governments felt they needed more representation they're worried that the council sort of looking more and more like a state agency, and they want the council to be more of a collection of interests of the local governments and people in, the, in this region. And so I think, I think having a, I mean, put Mayor Hovland on. It's not bad, right? Put Peter on. Where's McLaughlin? He, he'd be a good council member. So I just don't, I don't think it should be elected, but I think appointing some elected, mm -hmm. of local elected officials would help would help the council. But you know how much work an individual council member has to do. How in the world could you be an elected official with a burdensome job already and do that too? I, I understand that. Yeah. But, but I mean, most people that get appointed have like a full-time job too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing if you work for United Healthcare, you probably work a lot more. I mean, supporting that argument yeah. is the, a voluntary uh, arrangement called a regional council of mayors. And nobody forces those people to meet monthly. There are, I don't know, some 40 or 50 of them, center city, suburban. Uh, when they decide they want to do something, they actually go get it done. And they're working right now on this urban-rural divide. Maybe they can have some influence over it. Certainly pretty toxic so far. But that's a good argument for dual roles, you know. So, Sue? Uh, both you and Kurt mentioned uh, the urban-rural divide. The council is definitely getting more controversial uh, for good reason, bad reason, or no reason at all. Do you think that that controversy is hampering the council's ability to be effective? I, I don't think it is. Um, I think that uh, whenever I have had to represent the council in controversial settings, and I had a lot of them in the four years that I was there, um, you know, I kind of always look at it like, well, hey, isn't this great? People care enough about where they live and about the project the council is um, wanting to lead on to come out and tell you exactly what they think about it. And wouldn't I rather live someplace where people care that much uh, about where they live and they feel like they have a stake in it? And, and we should have a great community engagement process to continue to listen and to change what we do based on what we hear. And I think the council has gone a long ways in that direction, and I think it can continue to go further that way. Um, I think that uh, <laughs> the idea of does the controversy make it less effective, I don't think it helps us. I think that the issue of trying to get that permanent transit funding source that everyone knows we actually really need, um, we have not been able to get that because of this uh, rural urban divide. And I think that's, that's not good for the long term. So people who really believe that we need that, that it's gonna be a better way to uh, plan and design and implement transit systems are gonna have to say, okay, I, I don't, this problem here hasn't been completely solved, but let's solve this one about the transit funding. So Ted and Kurt. Uh, kind of the same question, but you know, since you guys were chair, the, the, the council has gotten more controversial. Why do you think it's more controversial, and what was the tipping point? Well, I don't know that it is. Uh, it's, I've heard the assertion. I remember former chair Peter Bell was often very fond of saying that 98% of the people in the region didn't know the council even existed, and the other 2% went to bed every night terrified about what you might do next. Uh, I think it's getting more media attention because it is engaged in things that does divide people, that does stir them up, that's and that's probably a good thing. I mean, the worst thing that can happen to the council is not being be noticed irrelevant. at all, right. becoming irrelevant, right. that's right. It is obviously relevant. Uh, it's kind of ahead of its time, and as a vehicle, if it's used right, can be a tremendous advantage for the region. Ted? I think to be a good Met Council chair, you've got to be prepared to lose your job. Absolutely. And um, I remember some of the days explaining things to my appointing body. 
uh, Governor Ventura after, you know, it would be a bad editorial cartoon or something. <laughs> and those were some pretty bizarre conversations. But I had to go in with the idea that, no, we're going to do this. This is why we're going to do it. And some of the stuff was controversial. Um, so, uh, but on the second hand, when I did the, the stadium bill, I'd been out of that building for nine or ten years, I didn't recognize the place. I mean, you have conversations with people and all of a sudden you hit, touch on one of the rails and they start throwing things at you in their office. <laughs> I mean, we would sit outside the, the, the caucus where Julie Rosen would go in and present what the bill was going to be on the floor. They would be in there for three or four hours, cussing, throwing chairs. I mean, it was, it was not a place that I knew when I was a state legislator. So I say that in that all of our politics has become more controversial. It's become mean, and it's become stupid, and it's a real problem, and the Met Council gets caught up in that like everybody else. And I would say further, Brian, that I flagged on some of the briefing materials in the reminder that both Governor Dayton and Governor Pawlenty vetoed a bill about staggered terms on the grounds that it would reduce accountability. And I have to tell you my personal reaction to that is that it only reduces the accountability from a governor. It does not reduce accountability generally. And to me, uh, I see Carol Flynn is here. Uh, I remember poignantly the call she made as chair of the conference committee in 1994 to me asking me if I would go ask Governor Carlson if he would accept uh, a provision that would allow him to appoint people to the council to serve at his pleasure. And I remember telling her, Senator, I don't need to go ask him that. <laughs> and she said, no, no, you do, because I need to report to the committee that he has been asked, and this was his answer. So dutifully, I went to ask the governor, and he broke into one of those characteristic smiles and said, I think I could live with that. <laughs> well, it was politically astute as a trade-off in a conference committee. From a policy perspective, it was a terrible mistake because it did reduce the accountability of a body that had before occupied kind of a murky position between appointed and elected by having at least a modicum of independence from the staggered terms. We ought to get that back if we can. When they approached me about, uh, about and we all got together to kind of talk about what the, what the, the panel was going to be, one thing that no, nobody up here and nobody at the council wanted was this just to be kind of, you know, an exercise of, of backslapping, saying how great the council is and look at all the good things that we've done. So one of the things that I thought is that one of the questions should come from somebody who is a known critic of the, of, of the, of the council. And I was a little surprised, but that was a suggestion that was, uh, that was very, well, uh, very much embraced. So the next question that I'm going to ask, I'm going to direct it to Ted, comes from State Representative Jim Nash. Um, many of you are familiar with him. Uh, and former mayor, uh, former mayor of uh, Waconia and current state representative. And his question was, which I'll address to Ted, the council's scope of authority has grown over the last 50 years from simple planning to wastewater, transit, housing, and some believe that by 2040, the council will address such things as the achievement gap, social justice, and global warming. Has Minnesota's federal waiver led to a runaway scope of authority for the council? Going back to my previous comments, um, <laughs> we should tell Representative Nash that the duties and the authority of the Met Council were passed by a bipartisan group in the state legislature. Um, Carol Flynn was the author, the governor supported it, and the Met Council is doing exactly what the, le what the bipartisan legislature told them to do. So this idea that there's a scope creep of, you know, operations and planning put together, if that's why you're really upset at the Met Council, we could probably sit down with Representative Nash and, and calm his nerves a little bit. <laughs> I, do, I do think, though, going forward, I think the, the Met Council, we had a policy called Ask, Don't Tell. I think it's critically important that the Met Council not go off on something new unless it's asked to take it on. I think that's where a council chair, a council is going to get caught up. And, you know, these local governments will tell you. And you know, when we, 
what, one of the things we tried to do was in, institute, um, you know, look at the type of development, not just the amount of development. So we were pushing, you know, mixed use, transit oriented development, all of that. But before we put that into the blueprint, we had this thing called Smart Growth Twin Cities, where we went around the region and sat down with citizens and local elected officials and had them do a board game on, okay, how do, how do you want to grow? So we asked them. And every time, the first time they did the board game, they were going to grow the same way they had over the last 30 years. And then they looked at it and went, my God, this doesn't work. And so we took the results of that uh, exercise and put it into the blueprint. And I think future chairs and council members need to remember that you got to be asked, because if you stick your neck out too far, um, that's where, you, that's where you could fail, and that's where you could put this organization in great jeopardy. I, I would say, though, that if you're at the council and your, your vision and your responsibility is for the long game, and that's what infrastructure is always about, um, you know, we can't get to the future by looking at the past. We just can't. It doesn't work. And so we have to think about how to engage everyone in that conversation because local governments, you know, um, have, should have skin in that game as, as well as the council. But uh, what we can imagine this community will be like 30 years from now when we were doing our 2040 plan, I just kept thinking, oh my goodness, that is such a long time from now and how can we <clears throat> really imagine, you know, what, what this will be like. So I don't think it's scope creep. I think it's just smart. Um, there are, we have to take in the information and imagine what the future is, is going to be. Without disagreeing with anything that uh, my colleagues have said, I do think it's worth doubling down on how important it is to decide what the council is into and not into. It may be the single most important thing that the body does. And sometimes it may depend a lot on what you're asked to do. But there may also be a role for audacity. And if I have a worry about the equity agenda, it is that it may concentrate so much on the barriers and not enough on the upstream cause. But if you start concentrating on the upstream cause, which is not enough people prepared to do the kind of work that is rewarded in today's economy and the one we expect to have in the future, that gets you into the education universe. And once you're there, you are into a completely different radioactive world. Most mayors have run from it, even in the places where they're presiding over obvious terrible decline. And so this is the most important debate you can have. You ought to have it. You ought to listen to the people that are asking you to do something. But in the end, it is a strategic judgment you have to make about what's in and what's out, what's more important and what's less important. Sue, you referenced housing. And that's something that uh, with the housing plan being created during your time as chair, uh, you've been very instrumental on. Uh, what specifically do you think our region should be doing on housing? Well, I, I think that the council's housing policy plan is a huge, huge first step in that direction. It's gotten everyone focused on what local governments can and should be doing. Um, uh, I think the example that uh, uh, Aline gave in her remarks about the idea that the mayor, a carver who owns a coffee shop, is concerned that the people who work in his coffee shop can't afford to live in Carver. Um, that's fundamentally the issue. And this is an issue that only gets solved with more people uh, focused on it and saying it's a top tier issue. I'm so thrilled that the governor has now um, uh, a governor's task force on affordable housing. Uh, we have to put more resources into this. Um, if wages aren't keeping up, rents are rising, the cost of home ownership is rising. There is only one way to help solve that problem, and that's with some additional public investment. The public investment goes so far. A little bit of public dollars into affordable housing has a return of six to eight times with private investment. So it's an efficient and an effective use. And stable housing is really about families and people. 
and uh, kids do better at school. Moms and dads go back to school and get education when their housing is stable and safe and affordable. Families are healthier, uh, and it really propels uh, economic growth in the region. And so I think our housing policy plan is a great first start, and I think each local government is really focused on how to achieve their own goals. And I, I really commend uh, the, the municipalities in the region for really taking this to heart and working on it. We've heard our two mayors uh, in Minneapolis and St. Paul who were recently elected saying it's also a top issue for them. So it will be a key issue. I'd like to see it be a top tier issue so we could get more attention focused on it um, because it's a solvable problem. It's not an unsolvable problem. It is a solvable problem. How would you respond to people who say that the housing, uh, that the efforts that the Met Council does on housing are duplicative of other um, programs that are happening at the municipal level or with housing finance agency? Oh, I, I think they're actually completely coordinated and there's a kind of a <laughs> unified grant program uh, that's so important to this. Uh, the coordination of the livable communities grants with the grants that the state makes that the cities apply for the Livable Communities Act. So they're the ones saying, this is what we need in our community. So they're leading that conversation. And I think that is what's really important. So I don't think it's duplicative. What I heard from mayors and local governments when I was at the council is that, hey, help me. I need more resources. I'd like to see more affordable housing de developed in my community. I can't do it without a partner. I can't do it without help. And so, no, I don't think it's duplicative at all. And I, I, a big credit to the creation of the Livable Communities Act grants, the role that's had in development uh, in the region. It's just been a phenomenal impact. Kurt, <clears throat> uh, in 1995, during your time as chair, the Livable Communities Act was adopted by the legislature. Talk a little bit about how that program came, ab program came about, what was the need identified, and why did the council take on that role? Well, I would defer to former yeah. Senator Mondale, who was the author of that for a much more intimate knowledge of it. I would only say that in the course of promoting the legislation to be passed, the mayors in this region got behind it. That's my memory of it. And it may have been the first time in a long time that most of the mayors signed on and said, this is the legislation we want and this is the year we want it. And there should have been a lesson in that, that if mayors stand together on something, they can get it. Uh, they are a voice that collectively is very strong. But most of it was the brainchild of the gentleman over here. So. <laughs> I, I would say the, the bill came to be because of the newspaper article that called us Murderapolis. And I think there was a recognition that our core cities were going <laughs> the wrong way. Now, I got, in, I got into all the, I, I ran like everybody else, right? I'm for children, senior citizens, clean air, <laughs> lower taxes, safer streets. But St. Louis Park also has the highest number of, of Superfund sites of any Senate district in, in, in the state. And so it became very clear to me, especially at chamber meetings, that there were companies that have been there 40 or 50 years and said, look, I can't, I'm making a lot of money. I need to expand. I can't go to my bank, who's making money off me, and expand because of the way the joint and several li liability was happening. So it, it, we, we had a system in place where we just assumed that older communities would die. And I think the idea was, and Kurt was in there you know, all the time, Carol was in there all the time, we sat around and said, okay, we have to do something. Most of the stuff we didn't know whether it would work or not. Um, my political future was threatened by the Mosquito Control District because we <laughs> cut some of their money and put it into it, which helped. Um, and it didn't rain that summer, so we, were, we, we made it through. Um, but I think, I think it was a reaction to the recognition that older communities were dying. It was having a horrible impact on this place that we lived. And it wasn't, we'd ne we'd never, we didn't think anything like this could happen in this town, and it was. And so I think a lot of those, there was a number of bills put together and pushed through, including the Reorganization Act, that uh, were put in place to say, let's try this. And most of them have worked pretty well. But I will tell you, none of us knew whether they'd work or not. No, we didn't. 
So we'll stay with Ted. One of the biggest obstacles for a lot of what we've been talking about today is funding. And funding, you know, becomes a bipartisan issue. When you think of the future, what do leaders need to do in terms of funding infrastructure? I mean, I, I don't, don't really know how to answer that. There need, we need to invest more than we are. I mean, right now, if you talk to the opt-outs, they're saying, hey, the opt-out transit, they're saying, hey, the Met Council's starving us. We're not getting enough to grow. And I'm Southwest Transit guy now, right? And if, if you talk to the, the Met Council, they're saying, you know, we're getting squeezed. And you talk to the, the road folks, they're saying all the money's going to patch up older roads outstate so that the, the bottlenecks aren't being taken care of. There's not, we're not funding these programs, these infrastructure programs, at anywhere near the level that we need to, to, as I said earlier, to be able to grow and to be able to attract and retain people living here, because it's, it's going to catch up to us, and it's starting to now. And yet the hardest bill to pass always seems to be the transportation bill. Why is there not public demand to improve a situation that's obviously in decline. I don't know. Makes no sense. Uh, with, uh, you know, with a legislature that appears as though it will not be raising a gas tax, do you believe that the, that, uh, the general fund should be opened up a little bit more to transportation projects? I would like for somebody to explain what the resistance is to charging users more for something they put a value on. I don't understand that. It's, it's, it's not a disingenuous question. I really don't understand the resistance to it unless it is kind of a, a symbol for if you let that tax rise, you might let other taxes rise. I don't know. I, I, I just think if you think about the gas tax and uh, all the fights we've had about that for so many years in this state. Um, it feels like 20 years from now, people will go back and laugh at us yeah. for fighting about the gas tax because hopefully we're going to use less and less gasoline as we go on. It's not a growing source of revenue. Right. And so um, I think we really have to be thinking differently about uh, the way in which we collect that revenue and and I love the idea of tying it to use. I think that makes a lot of sense. Kurt, when you were chair, there was a major technology revamp of the wastewater treatment uh, system. What was one of the biggest challenges during that time, and what do you think the future uh, for major technology revamps by the council will be? Well, that's an interesting question to follow the infrastructure question because wastewater-like infrastructure is something that most people don't think about. Uh, it's not sexy, it's not conspicuous, and as a council member, you only worry about it if somebody's sewer line breaks in Minnetonka on a Tuesday morning. Then you worry about it. Uh, so I hope this is not going to be a science quiz, because I've forgotten all those fancy technological terms that they drilled into us in those years, but it was necessary to rebuild and put in new technology for a lot of the ways that the wastewater was processed. It wasn't like there was a sudden epiphany of altruism spreading among council members and staff. I think Wisconsin was suing us at the time because the water downstream in the Mississippi River uh, was toxic. And so we made this pledge, which has been honored now, and uh, I remember some council chair offered actually to drink some water that in the Mississippi River after it had come out of the wastewater treatment plant. I never offered to do that. <laughs> but it is true that our water comes out of the wastewater system now cleaner, uh, more efficiently than it does in most regions in the United States, as the chair was pointing out in her remarks earlier. Uh, nobody, that was not much written about in those years. Um, we were spending hundreds of millions of dollars redoing something that was antiquated, that had to be replaced, that had to be updated. So I think part of the responsibility of council members is to recognize those. I've noticed over, over the decades that it doesn't matter whether the council is Republican or Democrat or hard to classify, if you put enough facts in front of people with those briefing papers before every meeting, most of the people, most of the time, respond to facts. 
And that council certainly did, and they said, we've got to do it, and we did. We're coming up on time. Uh, would you, anyone like to make any kind of final remarks or fond remembrances? Let's start with Ted. I think this is the best job I've ever had, um, being council chair. I had the support of the governor, um, and we had an agenda, and it was kind of fun implementing the programs that you passed in the legislature. And, and we, had a, we had a good time here. We had, uh, we had the wind in our sails. We were running hard. I had a good council that was appointed. And um, it was like playing chess on nine different levels. I was young back then. I could, you know, I and wouldn't you, want and, it now. You I'll got tell to you sit that. Across from Governor, you got to sit across from Governor Politi when the Hiawatha line was open. And say <laughs> yeah, something memorable the, the to The Transit guy snuck me on the train. Of course, I wasn't invited to the Hiawatha line opening because I had oh nothing to do with it. So the Met Transit guys got me on the train and sat me right next to, down next to Palenti, and he was like, <laughs> that, that was pretty fun. That was pretty fun. But I see a lot of old friends here, and um, I always look back fondly on those days. I think we did well. I think we had a lot of energy, and we had a lot of swagger, and we survived. We didn't get eliminated, and it's nice to see all of you back again. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess I would say that uh, opening the Green Line uh, on June 14th, uh, 2014 was uh, just a, a peak experience. And I think, couldn't it, the, could the weather have been worse? I mean, for all of you who were there, uh, it was the worst weather imaginable for that uh, extraordinary day. But what was, I, I will always remember all of the community celebrations at every single station. Every single station had layers of community investment. People had worked so hard uh, to bring their unique community perspective to that green line. And you know what? They were there. It didn't matter that it was raining and it was windy and it was a miserable weather. The community was there and they were thrilled. And that will always be my highlight <laughs> from the green line. And I would only say, Brian, that with each passing year, I feel like it's more and more of an honor to have served and I realize behind that feeling is the respect I have for the council members I served with, their commitment, their diligence, their hard work, and the professional committed staff. They made us all look good all the time. Thank you so much for letting me do this, and uh, please uh, thank our panelists. <laughs>